Okay, everyone. Our long-awaited cameo appearance by Giller Prize winner, Dr. Vincent Lamb, uh, is about to begin. Again, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Lamb, surgeon and writer. What a combination. How many people can say they have a book about the flu with a foreword by Margaret Atwood? <laughs> I'd say that is a coup d'etat. Um, we, uh, we are going, I'm going to introduce John Baker, former visa officer in Southeast Asia just before the fall of Saigon. And John is in turn going to introduce Dr. Lam. After uh, the reading from the new book that we've spoken about, which is, as I mentioned earlier, on sale over there, we will have a book signing. So please take advantage. And without further ado, first of all, John. Thanks, Jennifer. If I'd been asked a year ago, who's Vincent Lamb, I probably would have said, I think he's a writer. But that's about all I could have said. And back in March of this year, my wife handed me a book. And I usually read nonfiction, but uh, my wife, and my wife reads all the fiction in the family. She handed me this book and she said, you've got to read this. I think it'll remind you of your visits to Vietnam. So she handed me the book and it was called The Headmaster's Wager. And of course I read the book jacket and it described Vincent Lamb. And I then went on the internet as we all do today and Googled Vincent Lamb and found out a lot more about him. And it became more and more interesting with every page that turned. Vincent was born in Canada, in London, Ontario, to parents who had been part of the expatriate Chinese community in Vietnam. He was raised in suburban Ottawa and studied biology at the University of Ottawa and subsequently medicine at the University of Toronto. But he was always interested in writing, even going back to his childhood. His first book, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, this is his first book, won the 2006 Scotiabank Giller Prize. How many people get to do that? And was subsequently adopted for a television series on HBO Canada. Later, he co-authored A Medical Guide, The Flu Pandemic and You, which won an award from the American Medical Writers Association. His biography of Tommy Douglas was published by Penguin as part of the Extraordinary Canadians series. But the best, certainly for me, was his latest book, The Headmaster's Wager. It's fiction, but it's based on the life of his grandfather. And it was a finalist for the 2012 Governor General's Prize. It is set mainly during the Vietnam War, and the flawed hero Percival Chen is the headmaster of an English school in Cholon, the Chinese suburb of Saigon. When I first contacted Vincent, I told him, as I read the book, and I couldn't put it down, it was the most evocative book I have read, and I have read a lot of books set in Southeast Asia and in Vietnam. It was the most evocative book I have read of what Saigon was like in those years leading up to April 1975. So, Canada's Sanjay Gupta, <laughs> Vincent Lam, will <laughs> give us some thoughts and then a reading from the Headmaster's Wager. Vincent. Thank you very much for those kind words, and thank you for having me here. Uh, 
especially thanks to all of you for your patience. I should have anticipated that Toronto construction would double the estimated travel time that Google Maps predicted. Um, so sitting, you know, immobile on Bathurst, trying to get up here and thinking, man, <laughs> I haven't been up this road in a while and I won't be coming up here soon. <laughs> but I'm really worried about the time. So thank you for your patience. I know I'm a little bit tardy. Um, this book indeed has to do with my grandfather. And I usually try to sort of walk this fine line and say, well, you know, it was, uh, it was inspired by him. And this fine line is important because my grandfather in real life and the character in the book, the main character shares these characteristics, was a very, very talented and brilliant man in many respects. And he was the founder and proprietor and the headmaster of a successful English school in Cholon, which was sort of a Chinese district of Saigon. And meanwhile, he had a few notable flaws. And you know, everyone has flaws. But insofar as his talents were larger than many people, his flaws were also larger than those to be found in many people. And his flaws included an appetite for gambling, an appetite for uh, excellent cognac, and an appetite for beautiful women. And so these are all things that were very interesting to me when I became acquainted with the story of my grandfather at the age of about 13 or 14, because what teenager is not interested in gambling, <laughs> pleasures to be imbibed, and, uh, and beautiful women? I mean, you know, of course, naturally. So, um, so I recall an early interview around the book in which someone said, oh, OK, so so you identify very strongly with your grandfather. And you've said that that's why you wrote this book. And I said, yes. And they said, all right. You just explained to me that your grandfather uh, was quite a talented man, but he was also a compulsive gambler and sometimes an alcoholic and a philanderer. Well, Dr. Lamb, <laughs> are you a philanderer? <laughs> No, absolutely not. Um, are you an alcoholic? I said, no. Uh, and are you a gambler? And I said, well, and this was shortly after the stock market crash. I said, well, you know, my RRSP is sort of <laughs> looking like I'm a gambler, but basically no, except that I'm a writer. And writing is kind of, to my mind, a long form of gambling. You know, you risk a great deal of time and effort in the hopes that you can produce something which is evocative of a certain time and place uh, and something which resonates. And you don't really know how the gamble is going to pay off until about four or five years of effort has passed. Uh, and then after you've done that, it is truly, truly a great reward, in my case, to hear from someone who worked in that particular time, in that particular place, um, speak of it as being particularly evocative of that time and place. And so thank you very much. I mean, for me, that's a, a gamble which has paid off, if you will. Um, so, uh, you know, and it paid off, I think, much more profitably, uh, not in monetary terms, but in psychic terms than many of my grandfather's gambles, which, well, you know, you know how gambling goes. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I thought about this book when I was very small, and then I'm going to read a short passage from the book. And then I'm sure because you're scholars in the era and in the area, there are lots of thoughts and questions that, uh, that you have, and we can certainly get into that. And I thought about this book initially, as I said, when I was about 13, 14. And so this was a period of time when I began to read more seriously. You know, I had been an avid reader, I think, from the time I was a child. And it was around this age, 13, 14, that I, I began to read, you know, the classics, Hemingway and Steinbeck, and, and the people that you should read. And I discovered that the people you should read were actually people whom I liked reading. And so that was a, a really fortuitous thing. And so I began to think about writing. And I began to think a lot about my family history. 
And of course, I had grown up hearing the stories of my family. And I also uh, grew up, you know, I was born in the mid-70s, and so I sort of became aware of the world around me in, say, the early to mid-80s. And so I grew up very much in the Cold War, and there was still this very active concept uh, of communism versus capitalism. And the conflict in Vietnam certainly was a cultural reference point that was part of that dialogue. Uh, and as you heard, I grew up in a suburb of Ottawa. I grew up in Nepean. And it doesn't get more sort of suburban or quiet Canadian than Nepean. Uh, it certainly didn't at that time. Maybe now it's more diverse. And I loved Nepean. You know, I, I really, really loved growing up there. But the perspective was very much um, a stereotypical Western perspective. And in that perspective, the concept of the conflict in Vietnam was that it had been this conflict between communism and capitalism. Um, and there were sour feelings around it because it wasn't clear at all that, quote, what should have happened uh, did happen. I mean, you, know, you all know how that conflict turned out. And so it was in that environment that I grew up. And I remember on one occasion being in a grade seven history class and, uh, and, you know, in grade seven history, they give you the vast sweep of the First World War, the Second World War. And at this point, you know, the, the normal teaching was communism versus capitalism, et cetera. And, uh, and the Vietnam War was mentioned. And I said, oh, you know, my, my father was drafted into the army in Vietnam. And the teacher sort of looked surprised. And I mean, the funny thing about growing up as a person of color in Nepean, I think, was because... Persons of color were so rare, you know, no one really uh, had as much of an opportunity to form stereotypes, I think, of those people um, who looked different as a group, because there wasn't really a group. You know, they're just one kid who looked different, right? So I think my, my teacher was sort of surprised, like, oh, oh, I thought you were Chinese. Oh, okay, so something to do with Vietnam. Okay, this is very interesting. And so he asked me about it, and I said, oh, yes, you know, my father... Um, he had gone to Australia, actually, for his education, and he was in Australia, and he received a draft notice from the authorities in Vietnam. And uh, the teacher said, well, I hope he was drafted by the North Vietnamese. Right? And I didn't quite understand it, but afterwards I figured out, oh, okay, wait a minute. Right, so I said, oh, oh, yes, I'm sure he must have been, yes, because that's what the teacher wanted, so... <laughs> You know, one learns very quickly as a student that uh, it's a safe default position. What the teacher wants, well, that must be the truth. Um, but of course, that was not true because he grew up in Chilon, this sort of area of Saigon, and he'd been drafted by the South Vietnamese and had been ordered to report for officer training. And of course, um, my teacher revealed his sympathies towards the war uh, and his concept of what people should have done in saying that, well, you know, if he was drafted in, well, by inference, saying that, well, if he was drafted by the South Vietnamese, he probably should have reported, because that was the right side of the war. And of course, he wasn't, and so. And, and you know what? The truth is, at that point, my concept of the whole thing was so vague, I didn't honestly know which side he had been drafted by. And so I began to think about um, the, the story I knew of Vietnam from the perspective of my childhood culture, which is very much a Western culture. Uh, and think about that in contrast to the perspective on the conflict and on the time, which I knew from my family stories, because I had grown up on my family stories of their childhoods in Vietnam. And their childhoods in Vietnam had to do with outings to the beach and the way things were at this club that they used to go to, Le Cercle Sportif in Saigon, which is a very famous club. Um, my mother, for instance, had memories of, of, seeing, uh, of seeing illumination flares at night and how beautiful that was. And, and you know, it was just this vague understanding that she had at that time that that was actually part of military operations. But as a child, she was just enchanted by how it looked. You know, so these were the kinds of memories uh, my father remembered. And this memory, um, when I think back, would have been predating the, the American involvement in Vietnam, but would have been 
surrounding uh, some violence in in the fifties, but he remembered um, he remembered there being violence and and everyone in the house putting mattresses up against the windows to stop bullets, you know, to stop stray bullets from coming into the house. And so I realized that in fact the memories that my family had were were very different, and the perspective of those memories was completely different than the narrative of the war, which I grew up hearing. And it was a perspective which had to do with family, and which had to do with people, and which had to do with my grandfather and all the money that he made, uh, and with my grandfather and all the money that he lost. You know, and, uh, and these were the things that concerned them. And so, at this time, I began to think about Vietnam. I began to think about my desire to be a writer, and I thought, wow, you know, this is a topic that really draws me. You know, I'm really interested in this topic, and I'm really interested in writing about this topic from a perspective that, that I grew up with, because that's a story that I don't hear very often. And that's really where this book comes from. That's sort of the, the birth of this book. And the journey ends up being, uh, a long-ish journey. I started thinking about it in my teens. It was published, I guess, in my in my late 30s. Uh, I'm still in my late 30s and will be for the next 20 years, <laughs> in case anyone is asking. Um, and I will say, just as a as a point of um, a commentary upon process, uh, you mentioned bloodletting. In 2001, I sat down to start writing seriously. At this point, I had finished my medical residency and I had a bit more control over my time. And I sat down and began to write this book. And after about six months, I began to feel I wasn't up to it, I wasn't ready, I wasn't confident in the sense that I didn't feel I had the repertoire of skills required. And so I backed away and went and wrote Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, really as a form of training and as a form of writing learning. Uh, I thought, you know, I really know a lot about medicine, so I'll write this to develop my writing skill, and I want to get to the point that I can actually write this book. Um, so although the topics are totally different, there's a very close relationship in that sense. Um, bloodletting and miraculous cures, and I don't mean to, to sort of um, disrespect it as a book. You know, I, I was very engaged by that project as well, but it was also meant to be a training project in order to bring me to this book. So, I'm going to read to you from a passage towards the end of the book, and some of this may be evocative of your time in Saigon. I mean, the entire time span of the book actually stretches from the 30s into the late 70s, early 80s, with the biggest emphasis uh, being things that happened in the 60s and, say, early 70s. But, but this, is, uh, this is the early 70s, and I'm going to try to read it um, in a way that doesn't give away too much because lots of things have happened up till now in the book, but some of them are surprising, so I don't wanna spoil it for you. But this is a time after which the Americans have officially left. So it's after 1972, and the conflict is officially over, but of course it's not over. And there's lots of military action still between the North and the South. And at this time, lots of people are becoming concerned about what will happen in Vietnam. And some people are not concerned. Um, a fair bit has happened to Percival, who is our hero or anti-hero. You can decide which once you read the book. Uh, but he is very much alone at this point, And many of the people whom he cares for are not in the scene at this moment. I won't say much more, not wanting to spoil things. Percival returned to the casinos and gambling houses at night, where he took particular pleasure in winning money from Guaylo. And some of you will know that refers to white people. Yes. And in the afternoons, he played mahjong at the Sanwa Hotel with a group of old faces. It was a little group that gradually grew smaller and smaller as one person's French papers finally came through, as another's daughter was able to sponsor him to Canada, Cheng, who had given up on the shirts and become an importer of Swiss watches, stopped coming to play. Everyone suspected that he had boarded a boat one night and would reappear somehow in Hong Kong, where he had connections. Later, they learned that he had been kidnapped and then killed because the family was too slow in raising the ransom. Police Chief May went to America for a police training course 
and did not return. He bought a liquor store in Florida, it was said, paid with cash. During an afternoon downpour in the middle of March, Huang sat opposite Percival on the covered patio at the Sunwa Hotel and shuffled cards for a game of gin. With only two players on this day, they had been forced to take up cards. Huang said, Hao Jiang, and some of you will know Hao Jiang means uh, schoolmaster, headmaster. <clears throat> I have a contact who can arrange departures. I'm going to leave. Why don't you buy a departure too? The price is a little high, but this guy has good connections. He'll be a smooth deal. Percival swirled the ice cubes in his whiskey. Some of the old-time Chinese traders say, it doesn't matter if the North Vietnamese conquer all of Vietnam. It's just a new army, after all. He looked past Huang to a skinny boy standing in the rain, staring at them from just beyond the edge of the patio. Percival sipped his drink. He said, they have seen new uniforms many times. We have too, but they have seen even more. There will always be Sang Yi business. So, what reason is there to leave Hao Chiang? The North Vietnamese have overrun Hue. You are confused. President Tiu ordered Hue to be abandoned. True, Hao Chiang. Yes. Last week's order was retreat, then he changed his mind and ordered it to be held at any cost, and then it fell two days ago. An American helicopter pilot told me that many Southern soldiers had civilian clothes under their uniforms. As soon as they were out of sight of their officers, they became civilians and disappeared. Flying above, he saw them doing it. Are you still hanging out with those white ghosts? Is that one of those CIA pilots? Those guys are paid a lot. They are reckless, bad gamblers. You are still selling them hashish, I suppose. Nice fellows, that bunch. I win a lot of money from them. Former CIA, they call themselves Air America. Well, of course, as they are out of the war. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. This pilot warned me to get out. He said the communist troops will be in Da Nang by the end of the week. The president is keeping a plane for himself on standby, loaded with gold. Tiu will flee to, to Taiwan and let Vietnam hang. Sang Yi, old friend, there will always be business. Maybe I can open a Chinese school instead of an English one, since the North Vietnamese are so friendly with Mao. We Chinese will always find something to make a nice profit. Percival took a long swallow of his drink. Those who say that, Hao Jia, are so old, they don't care if they are killed. Besides, you think the Vietnamese communists will love us Chinese in Chilun? Even in China, you and I would be shot as capitalists, old friend. Don't you remember 68? The northerners buried their prisoners alive, didn't even bother to shoot them first. That is the reason to leave. Having caught Percival's eye, the boy at the edge of the table smiled brightly. He was soaked by the rain without seeming to care. After the fall of Phuoc Long province to the North Vietnamese army in January, a flood of refugees had arrived to live on the streets of Saigon and Chilin. Across the street from the patio, a banner hung from a deserted government office declaring, Phuoc Long will be retaken, though there had been no counteroffensive. And already the northerners had pushed far deeper into the south. The rain plastered the boy's shirt over his collarbones and shoulders. His eyes were dark and intense, his two hands outstretched. Percival waved the boy over. He gave him a hundred piastres. The boy bowed deeply and scurried off. But that was 1968, said Percival, sipping again. And you think that the communists have grown more kind since then. Look, 5,000 American dollars each gets us to Manila. What? $10,000? We could buy an airplane, which you could have at that time. And who is this snakehead? It's my friend, the Air America pilot. It's easy. He'll sign papers. We've been employees of theirs for a long time, you see, logistics or administration, whatever, something like that. And so then we fly from Tan Son Nut in two days. They have started getting their own non-essential staff out. 
Ah, Huang, don't you see? Sang Yi, business. See, even your CIA pilot sees an opportunity. These Americans have learned how things are done in this country. Saigon is so good at spreading her legs and selling herself. Don't you see, the Northerners will soon be paying up just as the French did, just as the Americans did. Even now, as they wait to be conquered, Saigonese are trying to decide whether the best profits are to be made in hoarding food or fuel. Food might spoil, but fuel could explode during the fighting. I know. I know what people say. Some think Saigon will be left alone by the communists. The gateway to the outside. I've heard it all. Like Hong Kong, like Berlin. But why take the chance? Look, let's get out now. You can always come back. Percival took a big slug of whiskey. I say food and fuel. Let's invest together in both. Let's fill Chenap Singh, the school, with sacks of rice and drums of gasoline. Huang leaned forward. Hao Chung, it is different this time. This is the time to leave. You can afford it. You have lots of money. But to go where? I have everything I need here. Everyone knows, Hao Chung, that in the towns the North Vietnamese have taken, they begin their arrests and executions with those who supported the Americans, people like you and me. Just because the Americans use me here, we will go to America. Just because the Americans use me here, you think they will welcome me in their own country? I won't be useful to them there. How could I teach English in America? Huang said brightly, fine. Maybe you don't think the communists will win. All right, let me get right to it. You stay here, do what you want. Lend me the $5,000. It's nothing for you. Sure, how much is that in piastres? I'll give you whatever you want. No, Hao Chung, I need dollars if I'm to pay for this departure. Or gold, a hundred tiles. I can lend you piastres. You'll have to find the change for the dollars, the gold yourself. Ah, Hao Zheng. Huang threw up his hands. You haven't put any dollars away in your safe? Don't you know? In the past few months, gold and dollars have become more rare than a true patriot in Saigon. Percival shrugged. Deal the cards. Dejected, Huang began to deal, and as he laid out the cards, a little group of refugee boys ran towards the Sunwa Hotel, their feet patting the wet mud. They each held out two hands, grinning widely. Percival drained his glass and beckoned them all over. The little gang rushed to him, reeking of sweat and garbage, which they ate. He opened his wallet and took out all his piastres, several thousand, which they seized and grasped at and then fluttered away, thanking him and bowing as they ran. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lam. We're, we're going to have a few minutes of Q&A or what do you mean by that kinds of uh, commentary, Any, anything you, uh, you might uh, want to gander. And uh, then we will have the book signing and you'll have a chance to pick up a copy if you'd like to do that. Peter, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, Dr. Lam, uh, first of all, just to give you a point of disagreement, I don't think Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures is a practice book, I think. It's a very, very, very fine book. The fact that the novel is, uh, I wouldn't say it's better, but it's, uh, I, I do find that much more gripping because of the scene and, and the scope of the book. And I was wondering about certain elements of the book. Uh, uh, in my own mind, what is autobiographical or biographical and what isn't? In a certain way, you will, your explanation already has provided those because evidently your father, real father, doesn't appear to be either the young man who goes back to China or the grandson. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, you end the book with the grandfather, the hero. I think he's a hero. He's not an anti-hero in my view. Um, I, the hero kind of getting out, as I recall. Uh, do you have any idea in your own mind what would have happened to him at the end? 
Um, yes, OK, this is working. Um, I, I'm very optimistic for him, yeah. but I, I want to leave a certain amount of room for people to imagine. And that is chiefly because I like books like that myself. You know, I, I enjoy books with this sort of possibility um, of, of many possibilities in, in the ending. But I feel, I feel very fondly towards him, and therefore I feel very optimistic. Uh, I can tell you that my, my real grandfather uh, did stay in Saigon following the, um, whatever one wishes to call it, you know, the, the fall of Saigon, the, the liberation by the North, you know, whatever term applies, and was there for several years afterwards uh, and left but not on a boat. So I can say that much and ended up spending the latter part of his life living a, a modest and quiet life in Australia, which, w as it turned out, was modest and quiet, but not without drama, uh, true to form. And so I think as a writer, you know, when I began writing the book, to come to um, the earlier part of your question, when I began to write the book, I wrote events that in many cases were quite concordant with history, meaning the history of my own family, and I found it necessary to diverge from that. And I think that was largely a decision which had to do with feeling free enough as a writer to explore characters who existed fictionally and to inhabit them fully. And so that, that is how that divergence took place. But even as I made the decision to diverge from family history with respect to really most of the main events that occur with respect to the characters in the book, I felt it was very important to remain true to historical reference points as they existed in terms of the overall history of that time and that conflict. And so I, I read quite a bit in order to feel that where the stitching of my story causes the story to be stitched together with actual history, that those things were true. For instance, in the passage that I, that I read, there, there were banners after Phuoc Long fell. There were banners in Saigon declaring that Phuoc Long would be retaken, which it was not. There was this flip-flop over Hue in terms of the orders. You know, abandon it, hold it. And, and that was a historical truth. Uh, so in all those respects, I tried to remain true to the history because I, I feel as a writer that if I'm writing about history, it may be that I choose to have fictional things happen to my characters, but it's important from the point of view of respect of the events and my respect towards the events that it's plausible within the context of the overall history. I guess there's nobody else here. This will be a Mr. bit more than. <laughs> <laughs> but come back, come back. I'm enjoying the, the discussion. Dr. Lamb, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, I presume, given how good the book is, that you at some time actually went to Saigon. So I would be interested in knowing where in the process that took place. And then the visa officer in me has to ask, what is the story of how your parents came here? Sure, absolutely. Um, I did go to Saigon twice. I went to not only Saigon, but I went to, um, well, the first time I went, you know, I did a very typical trip in, in Vietnam and, and traveled up the coast and, and saw many places along the coast and ended up in Hanoi. And the second time that I went, all of this is in the course of writing the book, I focused my time really on Saigon and on a place called Hoi An, which for various reasons has a particularly Chinese character. And so that was relevant because I was trying to write about a story that took place largely in Chilun. So it was interesting to go back. I mean, by the time I went to Saigon for the first time, I had already done quite a bit of research. And I had a bookshelf full of the source material which I had been reading. 
And it's a funny thing because before I went to Saigon, I would often sort of think to myself, oh gosh, you know, there's so much research to do and yet I'm not sure if I really have a sense of the place. If only I could live there. Uh, if only I could spend all my time there, I could get this book done in six weeks, you know, no problem. And of course, that's a delusion that most writers have because uh, very rarely do good books get written in six weeks. But it felt like if only I could be there, then I could touch it and feel it. And interestingly, when I went to Saigon for the first time, the immediate thing which struck me was that, although I'd never been to Saigon before, I, I recognized from my reading that Saigon had changed so vastly from the Saigon that I was writing about that even if I lived there, I would not be able to just sort of walk out the door and access my story. So my first reaction was that that was very disappointing. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, it's a world that's actually gone. Um, whatever am I going to do? But my second reaction was that I felt this great sense of liberation because I thought, you know what, I have to take from it what I can and I have to place faith in my research process and in my writing process and in my habitation of the characters who, although they're fictional, I've imagined following a great deal of reading, interviews with many people who have lived there and worked there at the time in order to feel that the characters animate the time and the place. So it was very liberating in a way to know that there was no way to access the world that I was writing about. And all of that having been said, I got enough out of being to Saigon and felt it was valuable enough to be in Vietnam that I went a second time later in, in the process of writing the book in order to again inhabit the space and feel the rhythms of the day and get a sense of the sounds and the smells. Um, and certain other just intangible character things which are important for a writer. Um, with respect to your second question, my father left quite early, in fact. He left, uh, I believe, in 64 and went to Australia to receive a high school education. And he went initially and lived with a, uh, the family of an Australian teacher who was teaching at my grandfather's school in Saigon. And if you can believe it, you know, knowing what you know about my, my, my family background of drama, my father went and lived in this household in Sydney and found that this household was so chaotic that he couldn't study. And so he had to leave that house and he ended up living above a post office with a postmaster for, for, uh, for all of his high school, actually. So my father left as the American phase of the conflict in Vietnam was starting, but it was not fully underway. My mother left in, um, in 69, and so she left uh, after the Tet Offensive, and by this point, the, the conflict was well underway, and, um, and people understood that, you know, that, that it was a big deal. And at that point, it's very interesting because her family was in an import-export business. My father's family was in, um, well, my grandfather had his English school. And because of the circumstances of history, i.e. because the Americans were there and pumping massive amounts of money into the place, their families were doing really well. And so they were able to send her to McGill where she studied architecture. So she came to Canada as a student. My father, uh, won the gold medal in his undergraduate class at the University of Sydney. He studied agriculture because he had a desire to go back to Vietnam and help the poor farmers. So that was why he chose agriculture. He won the gold medal. He was the top student in his class. And he wanted to stay in Australia. He had a great time in Australia. He still has many very, very uh, fond memories and close friends in Australia. He had no reason to leave Australia. Uh, except that he applied for grad school. He was accepted to grad school in Australia, and he would have to teach in the labs. He would have to be a lab demonstrator. And he went to the head of the labs and said, you know, I've been accepted to graduate school. Uh, can I work in your labs? And, of course, the, the head would have known that he was the gold medalist. And he was told, no, uh, you cannot work in the labs because I'm only hiring white Australians. 
And at the same time, he had received a, an, an acceptance and a scholarship at Simon Fraser. So he said, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm leaving the country. And so he came to Canada. So that's how my father came to Canada. And, uh, and, and because they were childhood friends, they connected in Canada, uh, fell in love, became married, and so on. As, as an interesting, um, I think this will be of interest, especially to visa officers. Uh, so as a coda to the answer to your question, and then I'll stop talking because I know this is lengthy. Uh, my father had a long career with the Ministry of Agriculture. And towards the end of his career, he was seconded to the Department of Foreign Affairs. And so then he was sent to Beijing, where he worked as the trade counselor um, in agriculture in Beijing. And then he was, uh, and then he was posted to Delhi, where he served in the same capacity in Delhi. But he was very peculiarly Canadian. I think that he went to China as a man in the late part of a successful Canadian civil service career. Uh, speaking several dialects of Chinese, which he had learned as a child, serving as a Canadian diplomatic officer, never before having lived in China. <laughs> so he said it was always this very disorienting thing, you know, that the Chinese would come to meetings and they would see the, uh, the figurehead photo of Adrian Clarkson. <laughs> you know, and then they would come and meet with him and speak with him in Mandarin. <laughs> And, uh, and it would all sort of take them by surprise, but it was not without its advantages. Last question. One friend. Dr. Vincent Lam, when I, I read the book, you get a, a war. Yeah, I am very happy, so proud about one of the Vietnamese descendants who talking about the fall of Saigon. I prefer fall of Saigon, but I seem uh, whole heart feeling is your pardon, right? That's a real true story. Even when I read your book, uh, Wager and bet, that make me feel about refugee again. I don't know how the Vietnam War syndrome can get out of my head, but let me explain for you. When we flip our coin, right? One tail and one head, yes. The fly of the Vietnamese and the Bo people over the, the Chinese, yeah, in South Chinese or or uh, Eastern Chinese, Vietnamese, you know that. They said that around 1.5 million people came to Canada and over the world to the Filipino, Mali, and Thailand. But around over 1 million passed away by the sea in rape and go down to the deep sea. That means, yeah, I feel about the way yeah, the work you think that, why my people and Indo-Chinese risk their life. They make their life very much supply, became a gamble, gambling. They wasted their life. The, the, and we do know that from the law of probability, half is the coin, is the head, half is the tail. But here, it truly happened with my people and your people. So therefore, when we think that, because of the Canadian thing that, they should not get the, the Indochinese refugee they lie at a gamble, right? Then they open the hack. Only the Canadian people open their hack, open their government policy, then they can embrace the Vietnamese and the Indian refugee game to Canada. Yeah, when I think about your expression, I think that if I can meet Vincent Lam, I said that, Vincent, the true work is the fall of Saigon. Because we lost over one million people pass away in the sea, right? So I think that the form of Saigon is the true meaning than from the North expression. And the next thing is, whether whatever the case may be from the gambling casino, or with very much nasty mean when our people pass away by one million people on the sea, when they make their life become a whether, right? That's not a good game. Thank you, Canada, because they don't let that very much nasty gambling in the history of people, right? Mexican again. <laughs> yes, thank you for that reflection. I, I agree completely. You know, I think that the, the risks that people take, and, and this goes on to this day in many parts of the world, the risk that people take in fleeing 
countries for reasons of violence and, and political oppression is the ultimate wager. And I think you're absolutely correct. That's a, a potent uh, reflection on which to almost end. I would like to introduce Laura May Roth, who's been helping to organize this conference uh, for a vote of thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Dr. Lam, on behalf of everyone at the conference, we'd like to sh um, thank you for joining us today and sharing with us your story of how your family came here. It was very interesting. And as well for reading um, to us during the end of our lunch, we really appreciated that. <laughs> and we're also very happy you found the building. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, during the conference, we've heard from um, boat survivors, also former visa officers, academics who've been interested in the movement, but also those who have worked and supported those in the community that did come over from Indochina. <clears throat> we even had a form former minister that was working at the time of the movement come and speak to us today, which was very interesting. Now, listening to you um, today allows us to reflect on how um, Canada not only operationalized how um, the uh, Indochinese refugee movement, but also the re resiliency of the people that came over here and how they escaped and settled, um, <clears throat> but also how they contributed to our society, both culturally and socially, much like you have with your work. So thank you again for sharing that with us. And as a token of our appreciation, we've actually got you a book <laughs> to reciprocate, so thank you very much. And we do appreciate you signing some people's book um, because there is quite a few there, and I think most people have bought it, so thank you very much.